Welcome everybody to the Kim Barrett Show. I am your host, Kim Barrett, and on today's episode, just in here, we speak to Steve from iFly Flat. So if you are a business owner who spends any money in your business and you've dreamed of always traveling business class, this is the show for you. We cover off on what sort of things can you actually get points on. So if you're doing your spend, how do you build a points machine so that you can get as many points as possible in your business? Then how do you find and identify the right flights? And we look at a few of the cool ones. So we look at how can you get business class flights and how can you get first class flights when you're traveling around the world? So if you're a business owner who ever, ever, ever has dreamt of flying business and first class every time you fly, this is the episode for you. Now, Steve is amazing. He actually just did a training for our mastermind guys as well. So if you need any help when it comes to your advertising to get your spend going even better, make sure you check over at our free USB at www.freeusb.com.au so that you can get a few strategies to get that working for you straight away too. But let's jump into the episode with Steve from iFly Flat. Awesome. Guys, uh, today we are here with Steve from iFly Flat. Um, I'm very pumped. He's just finished uh, recording a training for our mastermind as well to help those guys really leverage. If you're a business and you're listening to this, you're going to love this. So Steve, thank you so much for joining us on the Kim Barrett Show. Tell us a bit about your business and how you got started. Yeah, cool. Thanks Thanks for having me. I started this about eight years ago when I realized that like using frequent flyer points was like the absolute cheapest way to fly a business class. Back, back then, even it was just at the start of starting my business. Actually, well, in a way, this business is a business because I found a way to fly business class for like way less than half price. So what it is, is my background is accounting and um, accounting by numbers. And somehow I actually, when I was flying for work, I was clicking the, these freaking fly points. Back then, it, they sort of meant nothing to me. But once you start earning enough, you go, well, what can I do with these points? And then I realized that I... Uh, it was without any work, I, was, I had accumulated enough freaking flyer points to fly business class myself, which meant like a $4,000 ticket with no effort. Then I thought, this stuff is actually pretty cool because I've got these, this $4,000 ticket for free. How can I get more of this stuff for free? And that's when that got me started thinking about how can I earn more freaking flyer points so I can fly business class. And, you know, being accounting minded and research based, you know, I figured out in a way that using frequent flyer programs properly is the way it is. The, the magic is the frequent flyer programs actually have a lot of value. It's just, I think they just added some complexity in it, which meant people didn't think that it's got value. So I think it's a bit weird because if you ask your friends, what do you think about frequent flyer points? They'll be like, oh, yeah, whatever. But you, you go, it's actually the best thing since sliced bread if you mm. get it right. Uh, and the reason why we work with business owners is business owners have uh, in the box seat to earn a lot of points because they got business expenses. So much so spend. It's, yeah. yeah. So, so it's like doing what you're doing anyway, but earning these points on the side, and then you can use these points to fly a business class. Uh, and, and the magic is the cost of earning the points, it's way less than the cost of the ticket. So yeah. you'd be virtually buying something for cheaper. Yeah. And you, and you talked a lot about this. You did, obviously just did a training with us of just building that points machine because business owners have so many expenses on a day-to-day -day basis that they have. And it's like, well, you could earn points, so you may as well if you can. And uh, obviously, and you shared a bit about in your business how you either help people find the point opportunities and the right cards to get to do that. And then also you help them find those, um, find those tickets because once you get those points, getting the points sometimes is not really that hard, but it's like finding the right way to use them and get them. And I mean, it gets frustrating because I know you, you book a flight and you're like, hopefully there might be an upgrade and then you try and then there's not. And then you get annoyed and you get lumped down the back in economy and you're like, oh, I want to be, be up the front. I want to be in the good seats. Um, but I, I do have a question for you because obviously you mentioned you can book business, you can book first. What's like the, can you get, like I know a lot of the, um, especially the, the Saudi airlines um, where they've got those things like the residents and stuff like that. Can you ever use points to get some of those really cool high end places or, or are they only cash? No, you can use points for the residents. 
but the problem is that it's really poor value uh, right. because that's that's where uh, the, the different classes cap out. So the resonance is like beyond first in a way. Mm-hmm. So how most airlines operate is uh, based on distance roughly for economy, premium economy, business and first, they have a, a set, what they call like an award chart, which is which is a, how many points you need to fly from A to B in that class for that, that distance. Mm-hmm. That the magic about these award charts is the prices don't fluctuate throughout the year. So once the, the table has been set, it's the same price every single day of the year. Uh, mm-hmm. The key thing is whether there's any seats or not. So when you have something like the resonance, which is outside that scale, they don't have this thing called an award chart. So the only way to book them is to convert your points into a credit and then credit to pay off the ticket price. And in and, and that way, it's a bit like points plus pay. So Qantas got this system called points plus pay, which allows you to use points on every single flight, but it's, you're effectively paying for the price of the ticket after converting your points into money. And, and that's a really poor value because you're not getting any benefit of uh, the fixed point price. You're just paying a variable cash price effectively. Uh, so yeah. yeah, so it can be done, but I would never recommend it because you're, you're sort of trading off maybe four or five first class flights for one residence flight. Oh, wow. So, okay. So not yeah. worth it. No, not, and unless you have... Tens of millions of points <laughs> to burn, and yeah, and you're looking for some fun. <laughs> yeah. So, and and then what is, is there? Obviously, you've got uh, economy seats you can claim, business and first. Is there one that is better value? So, I've I've done a fair bit of um, travel in in business class, and to be honest, I haven't been on many international flights because most of the time I might be going from Perth uh, to Sydney, Sydney to to LA or something like that. And um, a lot of the time, I fly on Virgin, and Virgin just have. Uh, on the Virgin Australia, anyway, they just have business class. But like, if you were to, if you were to, and this is something you, you told me before, which is like focusing on that end goal, which is my trip to here, and then figuring out the best points to go about it. Is um, like, is there a good structure? For example, like I know Qantas have a first. Is the, is it to find out the the class you want to fly as well? So if I go cool, I want to go to LA first class. Are there a couple of options from Australia that you can look at and kind of weigh up to see what's going to work? Yeah, so in terms of first class, uh, Qantas is the only airline that flies direct first class on mm-hmm. the A380. Uh, and then if you then if you then really want first class, you have to fly. Oh, there's not many options really. So otherwise you go via Asia. So flying Australia to Asia is typically only business class only. And then from Asia to America, you've got first class. Like Cafe's got first class. Japan Airlines got first class and sort of things. So in terms of there's some destinations that's just not served well for first mm. class. With first class, unfortunately, it's actually on the way out. They are, most airlines are actually winding down the first class options. So it's like maybe in the next five years or so, it's pretty much the, the heyday for first class. And then oh. you find that as airline bring on new, new aircraft, 787s, A350s, that they're not even bother putting first class in. They just, mm. uh, I guess business class is so good now. So business class is becoming like first class. Yeah. So airlines will still have certain routes with first class, only between the, the major capital cities mm. where some people will actually pay big bucks, but I will say most of the world are probably not going to have first class. And do you like... Uh, do you think that obviously, as you said, business class is pretty good. If you were, if you were, if you're working on points and you said, and someone a client came to you and said, I've got to go, I want to go here, let's say Perth, uh, sorry, so Sydney to, to LA, and I might want to go on the A380 first class. Do you reckon it's worth it or is business class pretty, like business class for the amount of points you're going to spend, is business class good enough? Yeah, that, that's true. Dep- I think there's a couple of crew criteria. Uh, one, it depends if a daytime flight or a nighttime flight. So it's a nighttime flight, you're going to sleep, then then you're wasted on first class because you're just sleeping. So you're not going to get you know, space and all that stuff. There, there is definitely a, a difference. Uh, so first class, I think the staff ratio is much higher. So you're going to get served and looked after more. You're going to get, if you like food in terms of uh, uh, champagne, wine, and food is much higher quality. Uh, in terms of space, it's probably 50% more space 
uh, compared to business class. Uh, and then obviously you can sort of walk around and things like that. But the gap is definitely closing. Like even that sometimes I felt like, well, if I'm going to be predominantly uh, sleeping or resting or, or not eating or drinking much, then, then flying first class, it, it just seems like a waste. Uh, yeah. But if you're going to be staying awake, then flying first class is where you're going to get the best bang for buck uh, yeah. because then you can, you can try everything. Uh, yeah, so even now, but I guess the thing is, if you've never flown business, then don't fly first class yet. Because otherwise, yeah. it, it's, they are incremental improvements of, of each one. Yeah. Uh, that makes sense. And so, like, if let's just say there's a, um, a business they're doing maybe like a ballpark of, let's say, a uh, million dollars a year in turnover, and maybe they're at 50% um, expenses, and it's sort of about $500,000 a year. If you were spending that much and you allocated all that and you were getting the right type of points, what sort of what sort of rewards flights could you generate? Let's just say that um, let's go for the other side of the world. Let's go from you were in Australia and you wanted to go to somewhere in Europe. weren't too phased about where, but you wanted to get into Europe. If you had that level of expenditure, what sort of like what sort of flights could you potentially be getting? Is it one business class flight? Is it a few? Like what would be the potential that you could have if you had that many points? Yeah, so half a million bucks a year spend, you probably earn about half a million points a year. Uh, you could get two bis- up to two business class flights per year return. Uh, and that then that comes down to which airline you fly with. So, so mm-hmm. for example, Singapore Airlines, uh, you can fly one person return business class for about 232,000 points, mm-hmm. 232. With, with Qantas, I think the number is about 289,000 points now. And then right. with a virgin, 278,000. So you get between one and a half to two flights per year out of that spend. Yeah. Gotcha. And, and each of those tickets are selling between eight and $10,000 each. So yeah. you know, you're saving between sixteen dollars to $20,000 a year on flights. Right. And so, and with that, when you're saying that, that many points, that's 100% points. So it doesn't cost you anything for those flights if you're using that level. Uh, you still got to pay airline taxes. So mm-hmm. different airlines charge different taxes. Uh, I'm giving a lot of kudos to Singapore, but it's true that like, their airline taxes are the lowest. So mm-hmm. going to Europe, you might pay a $400 return for airline taxes. But right. if you use your points to fly on Emirates or Qantas, you could pay uh, another thousand dollars more. So like a thousand two hundred dollars in taxes. So each airline has a different points and tax structure. Uh, so it's about picking, like if you can, you can pick the one that's lowest, but generally it's all about which airline has seats on the dates that you want to fly. Yeah. Uh, and then you can mix and match. So you don't have to fly return with the same airline. You can fly one way with one carrier, one way with another, because uh, you just yeah book the flight, book the airline that has seats. Yeah. So if you got, for example, you got the full redemption, like 260,000 points first going, cool, I'm going to buy myself a... Uh, uh, economy class ticket or maybe a, like a, uh, and at a certain level to then upgrade that. What's the differences in there? Because obviously there's there's so many different options when it comes to this stuff, right? Which is obviously why you have a business. Um, but for the for someone thinking about that, if you already have a ticket and then you're looking to upgrade it, what's the differences? Oh, actually, that's a really, really good question. The difference in points in upgrade is probably only about 10 to 15% difference. Oh, wow. So um, I think that that's a table that most people don't really look at. So let me just think about, so give me an example. So to Los Angeles, uh, using the old points, I'm not sure what, what the, so the corners may have changed last year, but using the old points, you, they used to charge 90,000 points to do a, a one-way business upgrade from Sydney to Los Angeles. And they used to charge 96,000 points just to full, do a full redemption. So oh, wow. it, it's, like, it's like less than 10% difference in some cases. So that's just the, the difference in points. But the, the problem with upgrades now is that there's much less upgrades available. Mm-hmm. So an upgrade is you, know, you bought an economy ticket uh, and you just try and request an upgrade. Uh, but the, the problem is uh, everyone else is trying to upgrade as well. So mm-hmm. you're not the only one that want the spare seats. You, so therefore it becomes a ranking system. So they rank it based on uh, loyalty status they, so if you have you know, platinum, gold, silver, they rank it on 
uh, what type of ticket you're on. Maybe you, you might be in premium economy. That outranks if you're in economy. And then once you're in each ticket, there's fully flexible uh, discount and all that stuff. So once you rank all that stuff, that if you, you know, if you're a platinum flyer flying premium economy, the chances for an, up, for an upgrade is really high because you're like rank number one. But if you're a discount economy flyer that's bronze or silver, it, by the time there'll be no seats by the time it gets to you. That's a problem. Mm. And so do they have different, so when, for example, the full redemption versus upgrades, are they different categories of tickets? So they go, we've got 10 here, four there, or do they fall into the same pool? Yeah, I, I believe they're different because the full redemption is tickets that you can book in advance. So they, they, it's a different bucket of tickets that they give you in advance. Uh, upgrades are typically, uh, for my guess, it, it's two things. One is last available seats that they can't sell. Yeah. Uh, one is seats that they, they kept open for uh, operational issues because what happens is there's always going to be flight delays, uh, different passengers transferring from different flights. So they have to allow some some seats for that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and obviously then there's some people will cancel their fully flexible ticket towards the last minute because they're not going. So mm-hmm. they, I, I believe they have an algorithm or formula that works out on every flight, how many spare business class seats there might be. They always will keep a few spare because even for the guy who rocks up at the airport and goes, how much for the next flight here? So to all that stuff. And, and then after they work their order out, then that's how many seats are available for upgrades. So it's practically last available seats, roughly. Uh, and, yeah. and, I, and I guess in some cases, if due to some operational error, not error, like operational issue that a flight's been delayed and they just put the business class passenger on your flight, then there will be no upgrade seats because they'll be uh, rank high in priority. Yeah. Okay, cool. That's yeah. so interesting to find out. Now, across the time that you've been running your business now, you, I think you said it's like you've done half a billion uh, point redemptions. Yeah. Is, there, is there anything that's kind of stood out for you as like a really cool uh, or like something that where you're going like, this was a really good uh, setup for us on how we did that. Is there anything where you, that's just kind of really stood out for you throughout the time of your business? Yeah, I guess like booking first class flights are, are really cool. Like it's really interesting. The Australian culture, uh, they don't like they don't like flying first class. So I would have thought in terms of value, first and business class value are similar, but obviously mm. first class got so much more wow factor. Like how many times in your life are you going to fly first class? But it's really, really interesting off the half billion points, most of it's business class. And the most common reason why uh, even sometimes, and this is the best test, Sometimes we found them a first class ticket and a business class ticket. And we're saying, well, we should try first class because first class is first class. They say, no, no, we don't want to spoil ourselves and get used to flying first class and then you can't go back. <laughs> but I'm off, the, I'm off to the opposite. It's like if you never tried first class, how do you know what you're missing? Like yeah. at least try it, check it out, and then, make a, then you can make a conscious decision First class is too fancy and I'm happy to fly a business, but it's, it's really, really interesting. So most of it's business class. Uh, I guess to answer your question directly, it's it's really trying different airlines. So we, we like flying people over there on one airline and back on another because they might be both business class flights, but each airline has their own differences. So, yeah. so until you, you try a whole bunch of different airlines like Qatar, British Airways, Emirates, Qantas, Singapore Cafe, can you really say which is your favorite because each have um, different food, different cabin, you know, different airports, different lounges. So that mm. all that stuff makes up the whole airline experience. It's not just the seat. The seat is just a, actually a very small part of your whole journey. Yeah, it's the whole experience. I, I remember we flew from Perth to, to Doha on Qatar um, in business and um, we just we managed to snag an upgrade at the airport um, and just kind of, talk our way our way into it but what, when we arrived in Doha though because we were in business business had its own customs so we didn't have to go through customs with everyone else because we were in business we got a private customs we got a lounge to go through have a drink some fresh fruit and there was one customs guy for the business lounge and there was no one else in there yet that hadn't got off the plane so we went through pretty quickly and we were there and he's like yep yeah, stamp the passport and we went straight <laughs> through and I was like 
well, if they had told me this was going to be the experience on the other end, it would have made a, a much easier decision because we were umming and ahhing. They're like, oh, you can upgrade for this amount. I'm like, oh, and obviously on the plane, it was great because we got to, got to sleep. But on the, the experience on the other end, as you say, you never know what's going to happen with uh, with that. So that's really cool. Now, um, what about for yourself? How, how many... Uh, what have you been? Have you been on a range? I'm guessing being the uh, the points hacker that you are, and you've got your machine working for you. Have you been on a pretty few cool flights? Is there anyone that's for you personally <laughs> where you were like, this business class was was really good? Yeah, yeah. So, I, like the, the Japanese airlines always have amazing service. Like you know, if you've been to Japan, you know that the service is, is amazing anyway. So and then you're flying first or business class and uh, Japan Airlines or ANA. That like the service level is even more it's sort of intense uh so they look after you real well uh, i guess i guess most recently the best first class experience i had was uh, flying etihad uh, on the a380 they got these things called first apartments and actually the, the space is they they can only fit six uh cabins so it's a single aisle so three on each side actually or three or four on each side i'm not sure the magic is you can have a bed and a seat out at the same time. So the, the thing is, you just don't even know where, where to sit because you've got all these choices. And there's also a little lounge outside you can sit. So if you're sick of sort of eating, drinking, sleeping by yourself, you can go out in a lounge and watch TV with some other passengers. So it's, I think it's one of those experiences where you just got so many things to do, you don't know what to do with your time. Yeah. Um, and the magic is... You know how most flushes you're like, oh, I'm, I'm glad I'm home. Mm. Uh, these other flights are like, just, just keep, keep going. going. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I yeah. love that. I love that. So if, if someone's hearing that, let's just go, you're in Australia. And like some some people I know, like my um, my dad is just say, he's a plane nut. He would literally go on a flight just to say, he hasn't been on an A380 yet. He hasn't done much travel recently. And I know he's, one of his goals is like, I just want to fly on A380. I don't really mind where I'm going. For an experience like that, what sort of points do you have to have to be able to go, cool, my goal is to, I want to go in a first class apartment on Etihad somewhere at some time. What's the sort of points that yep. you need to have to, to, to do something like that? So the best is if you're going to fly first class apartments, you want to go, go to Abu Dhabi. You want a, a long stretch of time, 14 hours, for example, that will give you a chance to try everything, you know, sleep, eat, shower, everything, the whole works. Uh, and then you get got some time to sit there and do nothing, and that, I think that's the magic of flying. So uh, it's two hundred and three thousand Virgin Velocity points each way to fly Sydney by Abu Dhabi to somewhere in Europe, and I think that that's probably the best value. So you fly one way uh, on Etihad A three eighty to Europe, uh, which is two hundred and three thousand Velocity points, and then I would say fly uh, Emirates first class uh, back for example, and that will be uh, about 192,000 uh, Qantas points or Emirates points, roughly. So so you see that different airlines charge different points, but they, they're going to give you completely different experiences. Uh, you're going to try all different things. Like the, the shower on Emirates first class is bigger, like massive, whereas the shower on Etihad first class is tiny. But obviously, then you've got more space and... So the Emirates first class, sorry, Emirates A380 has a bar at the back. You can socialize and chat to people. So, you know, the, the magic is every airline has their own um, pros and cons. Mm. Gotcha. So if you're looking to take, uh, you're looking to take, let's just say you're looking to go over with a couple, you probably need about 800,000 points uh, to, to try and get two of you over there and back again if you want like a first class experience. Yeah, yeah, right. that's right. Okay, cool. Got some got some goals. I know if my girlfriend listens to this, she's going to be like, Kim, you better start racking up those points. <laughs> now, for... It's very for, easy. <laughs> yeah, for a business like that, if they... Okay, cool. So you've got like, let's say you've got a goal like that. That's one of your goals. And you've got those two separate um, companies you need to accumulate points with. What's, the, what's one of the strategies people should be looking at? Because is there one type of card where you can leverage to get both of those angles? Or is it like, do you have to go and get two different cards and split your spend throughout the year. What's a, like a little tangible takeaway that someone could think about with something like that? Yeah. So American express cards are ones with the most airline partners. So uh, I guess most people, or actually not most people, like everyone should have an American express card and a visa or MasterCard. The American express card typically has even nine or 10 different airline partners. 
So in terms of airline partners, they've got the most. And then you've got the Visa MasterCard, which is really designed to mop up wherever you can't use American Express. Yeah. Uh, or whether the fee to pay American Express is too high. So American Express in my strategy is all the primary card. You pay everything in American Express uh, that you can, that has the right fees that you're able to. And then the Visa MasterCard mops up the rest because in my philosophy, there's no point wasting any money not earning points while you can, especially if the fee is low or it's free. So in some cases, someone might say, if you pay your Visa, there's no fee. You pay your Amex, it's 1%. Well, Free, like free points are better than points that cost money, even though the fee is still low. Mm. So, and so that's the strategy you have. Uh, and, and I guess if you can then channel about 75% of your spend onto American Express, then you'll be able to do, flick those American Express points into Emirates or Virgin or even Etihad or Singapore and then fly with those airlines. Gotcha. And that's an American Express with American Express, right? Because some people I know, they get an American Express and Visa, but it's with their bank. And so there's always different structure. But are you talking like direct with, it's an American Express card from American Express. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, from American Express. So so that those structures are closed now. Most of them are gone. So the only card that, only not, the Westpac and Amex is the only card that, that's a bank-related card, but that card's actually issued by American Express now as well. So all, right, all cool. MX cards are issued by MX directly. Okay, beautiful, perfect. Um, and Steve, thank you so much for all these insights. I know that all our listeners are, are going to be thinking about their, their their point strategies now and building their points machines. What's the best way for people to number one connect with you, or if they do, if they go actually look, this is something I need help with. What's the best way for them to reach out to? You? Yeah, so a couple of ways, like through our, through my website, like iflyflat.com.au. We have a you know, website explains our two services, which is one service is flight bookings. If you've got points and you find it difficult, we book it for a success fee. Uh, the idea is that rather than, than actually having, because the, the scenario is if someone's gone points and they've got a trip, they've, they've, they've only got two options. One is to try and find themselves a seat or secondly is either to pay eight or 10 grand a fly business class or fly economy. So I guess that we, we are priced in the middle of such that we charge them a fee and we help them use the points by business class. And our other service is like, well, one, you, you've got to have points to fly. So we give uh, business owners the advice on what car to get to earn the points for the right right price and right cost structure. Uh, yeah, so, so, and you can always find me on LinkedIn as well, on a, uh, on a Steve Huey or on Instagram at iFlyFlat. And, and those are all easy ways to talk to me. Beautiful. Awesome. So guys, make sure you go and connect with Steve. And Steve, once again, thank you so much for joining us and giving us some really good insights. I know I'm going to start uh, racking up my points so I can uh, fly fly first class to Abu Dhabi. That'd be awesome. Um, oh, that'd yeah, be awesome, yeah. As I said, again, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate your time.